Hey, everyone. Welcome. My name is Marilyn Shannon, and this is the Breaking Free Show. And it's very nice to have you join us today. Hope you're all doing well and enjoying the beginning of spring. Maybe where you are, it's not. But where I am, there's a lot of green stuff floating around the air. Even my clothes got green today. Go figure. Anyway, hope you're doing well, and um, I'm glad you're here. And just remember, anytime during the show, we love, 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 love you to comment, call in, whatever you like. You can call in to 919-518-9773. That comes right into the studio. Or you can join our chat and just put your name, nickname there and comment, ask questions from there as well. And then you can always come in on Skype voice. So that is without a picture. And that is computers. That's plural than the number 2K voice. And we'd love to have you any way you can come in. And before I introduce my guest to you today, I want to say hi to Amnon. Hello, Marilyn. How are you? I'm good. And you? I'm just fine. Thank yeah. you. Did you have a good weekend? I have a, had a great weekend. I just yeah. wish this pollen will get I'm washed away. You. It's been really like crazy. Yellow stuff. Yellow stuff. It's everywhere. You could play tic-tac-toe on my I car. I mean... Anyway, but it's okay. It's all right. It could be worse, right? Okay. So here we go. We're going to get on with our show. So I have a guest on today, and let me tell you what, you're going to love this man. He's heartwarming. He's a great storyteller, and he's just plain lovely. He is the author of Shot Down, the, story, the true story of pilot Howard Snyder, who was his father, and the crew of the B-17 Susan Ruth. His name is Steve Snyder. Here you go. And what I know about this book is hold your breath because there's active moments and activity and you just have to hold your breath and your heart at the same time. So let's welcome you, Steve. How are you? I'm doing great. Thank Good. you, Marilyn. Nice to be on the show. Well, it's nice to be here. And thank you for coming in all the way from California. That's right. No, <laughs> pollen, no pollen here. No, po no pollen ever? No. Uh -uh. Ever. No pollen, no bugs, no snow. Can't beat the beach in Southern California. You cannot. No, no pollen. Oh, my goodness. Goodness gracious. <laughs> I don't think I've ever lived anywhere where it didn't turn green at some point. <laughs> so tell us about you, Steve. Okay. Well, I was born and raised in Southern California. I was born in Pasadena, home of the Rose Bowl. Uh, went through uh, the school system here. Uh, went to college at UCLA. Uh, I was a classmate of Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, better known as Lou Alcindor back then. And then I got into a career of sales and sales management. The last 36 years, I worked for a company called Vision Service Plan, VSP, that provides vision care as an employee benefit that corporations offer their employees to cover eye examinations, glasses, and contact lenses. Uh, during that 36 years, the last 25 of it, I traveled extensively. I was national uh, or VP of national accounts, calling on Fortune 500 companies uh, throughout the country. And in the last 15 years, even though I lived in Southern California, I was vice president of our Eastern Sales Division, which was everything east of the Mississippi. So I, I again, I traveled uh, quite a bit. Uh, married, I've uh, been married for, uh, to my current wife, Glenda, for uh, it will be 35 years uh, this year. We have three grown sons. Uh, we also have a second home in Sedona, Arizona. So we go back and forth between Seal Beach, California, where I am now, which is about 40 miles south of LA, and then uh, uh, Northern Arizona, uh, Sedona. People are not familiar with it. It's where all the red rocks are, a beautiful place. And so that's kind of my history. I retired from VSP in 2009, and that's when I had the time to really delve into my dad's war history in more detail. I knew the basics uh, growing up. I knew he was a B-17 pilot. He was stationed in England with the 8th Air Force. Uh, his plane was named the Susan Ruth after my oldest sister, who was one year old at the time that he went overseas. And he flew bombing missions over occupied Europe and Germany and in on February 8th of 1944, he was shot down over Belgium after a mission to Frankfurt, Germany. And he was missing in action for seven months, but he evaded capture and eventually made it back to, uh, to England. And how did he avoid being captured? Oh, after his plane was uh, shot, shot down, his plane was shot down by two German Focke-Wolf 190 fighters. 
And uh, two of the uh, B-17 had a 10 man crew. Uh, two of the crew were killed in the plane. The other eight were able to bail out successfully. And after my dad bailed out, uh, he was hidden by uh, Belgian people, members of the underground for several months. Uh, after which he got tired of hiding, so he decided to join the French resistance and started sabotaging German convoys. Wow. And uh, then finally, uh, when Patton's Third Army came up through France after D-Day, he met up with them and got back to England. Wow, your dad was something. Yeah. Um, I don't know whether I or I don't know how many other people could have, you know, left uh, that relative safety. It really wasn't uh safe because when he was being hidden the german secret police the gestapo could break in at any moment and arrest him and he had some very close calls that are in the book about almost being found out by the by the germans mm -hmm. but he left that relative safety of being hidden and uh, waiting for the u.s armies to come up uh, and liberate the area but he wanted to get back in the fight uh, and you know, he risked his life not only fighting against the Germans, but if the Germans had captured him, they would have shot him right on the spot. Mm -hmm. So that took a lot of courage and a lot of bravery to uh, to do that. So I, I want to go more into the book, but tell me about your dad in general. Like, yeah. uh, he was uh, uh, quite a guy. Uh, my, uh, my, I have two older sisters, Susan Ruth, that uh, was the plane was named after. And then my other sister, Nancy, was actually born while he was missing in action. Uh, so that was really tough on my mother at the time. There she was uh, back in the U.S. in 1944 with a one-year-old baby girl and an infant uh, baby, not knowing if she'd ever see her, uh, her, uh, her husband again. Um, now I lost my train of thought. Well, you were uh, telling me about your dad in general. Oh, my dad, yeah. But my sisters and I, we always uh, kind of compared him to John Wayne or James Arness for the people that can remember the uh, TV show Gunsmoke. Uh -huh. He was a, a big guy, kind of a no-nonsense guy, rugged guy, but uh, a, a loving a loving father. He and I were very close. Uh, he coached my little league team, was always very supportive in my uh uh, of my endeavors and uh, playing sports. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, very hardworking guy. And like that generation, which I think are, is, is, are, is the greatest generation. You know, he had uh, a very good hard work ethic, uh, very uh, strong moral fiber. He and my mother were, were strong Christians uh, with a deep faith, uh, believed in hard work. Uh, really, uh, you know, just uh, uh, that generation were just unbelievable people. Yes, they were. And so um, what did he used to t talk about the war with you? Oh, uh, well, he talked uh, a little bit about it. As I mentioned, I knew the basics. But like most World War II veterans, he didn't talk too much about it. It wasn't until 1989. Uh, uh, this Belgium uh, foundation called the Belgium American Foundation, uh, formed by a Dr. Paul Delahaye that I'll talk who I'll talk about further. Uh, they erected a memorial to my dad and his crew in the little village of Mackinois, Belgium, which is where the plane came down, just north of the French border. And my dad and the other three crew members that were still living at the time went over for the dedication. And there he was reunited with all these Belgian people that hit him during the war, mm -hmm. saw these houses where it was hidden, and that brought it all back. And he started talking about it a lot after that. And then my first trip was with to Europe, or to Belgium, I should say, was, and I had been over there five times, was in 1994. I went over uh, to the 50th anniversary reunion with my parents, and that's when it became personal for me because I saw all those places where the events took place and was actually unfortunate enough to meet a couple of his Belgium helpers. Uh, they're all gone now. So uh, that was a very exciting uh, time for me to share that with my parents and with my dad. That must have been just amazing. It, it, it was. Uh, they they treated him like royalty. Uh, one time, they, uh, they're, they're amazing events. Uh, I'm actually going over for the sixth time this fall for the 75th anniversary of the liberation of Belgium, my dad's plane, uh, plane being shot down. And 
Uh, they last several days. Uh, they erect these huge tents and hundreds of people come to these events. All the local villagers, all the dignitaries, the U.S. military comes down, Belgian military, French military. They have these band concerts and lunches and dinners. And one time we got to this big tent a little late. Uh, this was in 1994. And uh, when we walked in, when my dad walked in, everyone in this tent stood up and started, started applauding. I get chills just talking about it. Uh, the, the Belgian people are wonderful people. To this day, they're still so thankful and so grateful for the Americans coming to rescue them and free them and liberate them from Nazi oppression. And they, uh, they just wonder, well, people, they couldn't have treated my, the, the, the president of the United States uh, any better than the way they treated my dad uh, when he was over there. It was a very moving experience. They become, fa you become family. Absolutely. Yeah. I've made some lifelong, deep, wonderful friendships uh, with people in Belgium. I look forward to seeing them again uh, uh, in a few months. That says a lot about them and your dad, that they could experience that and feel that gratitude and appreciation and realize what, what happened. Yes. Yeah. That's great. So why, tell me why your dad, why was, why was a tribute to him? Well, you mean the book or the... No, no. The, you said that they, they the had memorial. a... Well, yes. It, well, the memorial is to the entire crew. Okay not just my dad. And likewise, the book is just not about my dad, but it's really about what happened to each member of the crew, because something different happened to each guy. Five of the crew made it back home, but five of them did not. And it's all also about the courageous Belgian people that risked their lives trying to help my dad and his crew. And uh, they were unbelievably brave people to do that. If the Gestapo found out that they were aiding down airmen, they would be arrested, tortured, and either shot or sent to concentration camps. And some of the Belgian people that helped my dad and his crew met that fate. And it's talked about uh, in the book. Uh, unbelievably brave people. But as I mentioned, they were just to go through what they th went through of, of four years, the 1940 to 1944 of Nazi occupation and Nazi oppression, they were just so grateful for being liberated and be being free again and enjoying the freedoms that they lacked when uh, the Nazis uh, were occupying their country. So they just have a deep respect uh, and want to honor and remember mm -hmm. those allied uh, servicemen that, that came to free their country. Well, you know, it's like the Holocaust and uh, Amnon has a Vietnam show on, right? If we we'll talk about it, we won't forget. Now, in fact, my, my little motto or tagline is it's our duty to remember. Exactly. Which we must always do. Right. And I have a tagline sometimes I share, it's our duty to listen. Oh, you know, <laughs> I mean, it is. It's our duty to pay attention to these things. Absolutely. And share the Absolutely. stories. Absolutely. So, so what, what was it about this that you wanted to know more about? Uh, well, after I retired, uh, my parents had kept a lot of material from the war, war years, and I just wanted to go through that and organize it and find out more detail. Uh, at that time, in 2009, after I retired, I had no intention of writing a book uh, whatsoever. Uh, and there were two items that were really significant that my parents uh, had kept. One was a diary that my dad had, had written while he was missing in action about his plane being shot down. And it is absolutely riveting. And it's in the book. My dad was actually a, a pretty good writer. And uh, the other item were all the letters that my dad had written to my mother while he was stationed in England during the war. And he was very candid in those letters. He talked about what, you know, not he, he, of course he talked about his love for uh, my mother and uh, their devotion to each other. But he also talked about what bombing missions were like, what life was like on the base, his air base, the 306 bomb group at Thurlai, England, what life was like in England and London at the time, what uh, escapades of his, uh, his crew, himself and his crew, and uh, reading those letters, absolutely fascinating. And I just became fascinated with the story of my dad and his crew, and it became my passion. 
I started reading book after book about the air war over Europe. I went on the internet and just spent countless hours doing research, downloading declassified military documents. Uh, I went on a quest to find relatives of all his crew members to see if they had any information they could give to me. And I found relatives of all of his crew. And I asked them if they had any pictures or newspaper articles or letters that they could send to me to give me more details. Uh, I joined a number of World War II organizations, started going to reunions, listening to veterans tell their stories. And finally, three years into my uh, efforts or my research, I just came to the conclusion that the story of my dad and his crew was so unique and so compelling that it needed to be it needed to be told. People needed to read about it. And so I decided to write a book. <laughs> so on some level, I'm hearing you and I'm thinking, so you, so going to doing the re the kind of research that you did besides researching the other um, members of his crew was, was kind of validation for you, I would say on some level oh. about the stories and, you know, what your dad went through and all of that. Yeah. When I first started, you know, I thought, well, I'm going to start writing about it. I thought, well, it's going to be about my dad. And I, I quickly found out it's not just about my dad, but it's about all all the members of his crew. And there was about all the Belgian people. And it's really not just about my dad's crew, but it's about all the men who fought uh, in the 8th Air Force uh, during World War II. Uh, there were 26,000 men died serving in the 8th Air Force during the air war and the bombing campaign over Europe. That's more than the entire Marine Corps fighting in the Pacific during the war. Another 28,000 men uh, became prisoners of war after their planes were knocked out of the sky. Uh, being a combat crewman in the 8th Air Force during World War II was the most dangerous duty assignment in the United States military during the war. Uh, what those men went through was, was unbelievable. Uh, every day they went up on a mission, they might never return. Um, it, it, it's an uh, amazing uh, story what, about the air war over Europe and the 8th Air Force. And really the book is kind of two books in one. It's the story of my dad and his crew and what happened. But it's also a history of the 8th Air Force uh, the, uh, in the air war over Europe. The, the story itself is all based on firsthand testimony by the people who were involved in the events that took place. What I added was just a great deal of uh, historical information and anecdotes about and surrounding the war to put it into context and give it uh, background. So, so you wrote the book when? Um, the book uh, was released in August of uh, 2014. So we're coming on, uh, I can't believe it, almost five years <laughs> Since the book was released, uh -huh. and it's 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 done well. It's, it has a, a five star rating on Amazon, and uh, it's won close to thirty book awards. Uh, wow! Released, and there's over two hundred time period photographs in the book, so you can visualize everything that you're reading about. And there's lots of excerpts from letters of, from my dad, my mother, other members of the crew, and family members, so that, to make it real personal as well. What a labor of love, Steve. Yes, it uh, it was. It still is, actually. Uh, since I wrote the book, it's changed my life. In what uh, way? Well, after I retired, you know, I was a typical retiree. I was sleeping in late, taking <laughs> naps, going, going for walks, you know, doing reading books. And uh, now I'm basically working full time again. Uh, I go to air shows all over the United States signing copies of my book. I do a lot of uh, speaking. I make PowerPoint presentations to all sorts of different organizations uh, uh, ar around the country. I spend hours every day on the on the internet uh, promoting the book and contacting people. So really, it's a full time job. It's uh, and I love what I do. I meet all sorts of wonderful people at these events I, I go to. I meet lots of veterans and uh, uh, get to know them and learn their story. So it's very, very rewarding. Yeah, I, I I haven't done that. You know, I haven't sat with with vets and listened to their stories. And, you're, you know, listening to you now, it's kind of like, hmm, I, I really should because they are our heroes. Absolutely. There were 16 million veterans uh, at the end of World War II. And there's less than 4% of those men that are still with us and we're losing them at a rapid pace. 
Uh, there was no other event in history that affected more people than World War II. Uh, 60 million people died. Uh, millions more were wounded. Millions more were left homeless and displaced. It changed the course of the world and uh, the United States forever. So the brave young men who fought and died for freedom, uh, are, like I mentioned, are, to me, are the greatest generation and their sacrifice must never be forgotten. Right. And uh, it's really, uh, I'm immediate past president of the 306 bomb group, which my dad was in. I'm still on the board. And it's the mission of the organization and really the mission of my presentations as well to remember, honor and educate uh, remember the air war over Europe, the honor, the men that fought it, and to educate the public about it, especially younger generations, because World War II happened over 70 uh, years ago, and it's fading in people's memory, and we cannot let that happen. We have to remind them of what these men fought for uh, and to enjoy the freedoms that we uh, in enjoy today. Absolutely. So take us back into, like, in to some about your dad's diary. Like what were some of the things that you learned, like his, every, what he did every day? And just tell us about some of the things, the experiences that you read in his diary. Okay. Well, I, his experiences are more so in his letters. That okay. Because the diary was just about uh, kind of that day, uh, you know, going on the mission and then being attacked by the German fighters and the planes on fire and, I mean, it's, as I said, it's just riveting. Uh, but it, it's uh, interesting that the night before he and his, uh, like, as I mentioned, a B-17 had a 10-man crew. There were four officers. Uh, my dad was the, uh, the pilot, the first pilot. And as such, he was the commander of the plane and the crew. And as a result, he had the final say in what the plane uh, was named. Uh, only three of the 10-man uh, crew were married at the time, my dad was the only one that had a child. I think that's why they kind of boiled it down to uh, naming the plane after my oldest sister. But the night before the mission, my dad and the other three officers uh, went out to a little pub called the Falcon, which is near the base, which is still there today. In fact, I've gone there uh, when I've been in the UK. I'm going over there again, and I had a couple pints at that bar. <laughs> but but they tied one on, and they they were they were. Uh, uh, they were uh, got drunk the night before the mission, but uh, because but they were able to sober up pretty quick because those B-17s or those bombers of World War II, they weren't uh, pressurized. So above 10,000 feet, they had to go on oxygen or else they'd pass out in a few minutes, minutes and they could die. But breathing that uh, pure oxygen, you know, sobered them up uh, real quick. And so they, they uh, were feeling okay after that. And uh, he thought it was just going to be like uh, an, an, another mission, you know, a bombing mission. Uh, he had kind of overcome his fear about going on missions, although when he got to the bomb run, uh, they were still uh, uh, pretty nerve wracking. Uh, uh, getting those, those planes weren't pressurized. So uh, it was extremely cold at the altitude that they were flying. It was minus 40 to 60 degrees below zero. So frostbite was a huge problem on these uh, missions. And a lot of uh, airmen suffered serious frostbite injuries that put him in the hospital for months. But it, they, when he was on the bomb run, even though it was so cold up there, he would be sweating profusely from the adrenaline running through his body. He said he'd just be dripping wet with uh, with 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 sweat with sweat, because not only did they have the uh, the German Air Force, the Luftwaffe, to contend with all these German fighters uh, coming to attack them, trying to shoot them down, but they also had to face uh, anti-aircraft fire. Uh, these German flak guns, flak was a abbreviation for the German word for aircraft defense cannon, and they were deadly weapons. They fired. Uh, shells about 20 shells per minute and these shells were calibrated to explode at the same altitude that these bombers were flying and these shells were filled with all different shapes and sizes of razor sharp metal that would explode out hundreds of feet and easily penetrate the thin aluminum skin of these uh, these bombers if a bomber was hit directly by one of these flak shells uh they just 
it, it explode and basically disintegrate and disappear, or if it knocked a wing off, these bombers would just plummet to the earth. So these bombing missions were, uh, you know, harrowing, uh, harrowing experiences. And uh, they, my dad had, uh, the plane had dropped their bomb successfully, um, but the bomb bay doors got hit by flak and they couldn't get the bomb bay doors back up. And that caused a drag on the plane and they started losing airspeed and started lagging behind the formation. And they were singled out by two uh, German Falk War 190 fighters who, like wolves or uh, lions coming to attack prey, swooped in for the kill. And in the ensuing air battle, uh, the Susan Ruth was, was shot down. However, both those German uh, fighter planes were shot down as well. One was piloted by Siegfried Merrick, and it crashed, and he was killed in the plane. And the other was piloted by Hans Berger, who was uh, able to bail out, and he made it through the war. Actually, the gunners on my dad's plane shot down Hans Berger's plane, so they really shot each other down. Uh, during my research, uh, that's kind of a funny story, uh, one day my wife just casually mentioned, well, why don't you try to find a German pilot that shot down your dad's plane? Like, it's as easy as going to the, the grocery store and getting a loaf of bread. <laughs> You know, and I'm thinking, well, she doesn't have an, any idea what she's talking about. You know, it's, she's crazy, you know, the, the, the stupid idea. But like a good husband, I did what she told me to do. And lo and behold, I found Hans Berger. And fortunately for me, he became a translator, translator after the war. So he speaks perfect English. And he gave me some wonderful insight that's in the book about what it's like to go up against the 8th Air Force. Hans is 95 years old today. Uh, uh, still living uh, in uh, Munich, Germany, and we've become friends. So let me ask you something, because this is a good place for me to ask you this question. So, I mean, he, he you know, was shooting at your, at this plane, at your dad. What, what, what was his feelings about what he did? Well, he was really pretty much just like the U.S. airman. Uh, he was, you know, just a young guy, 20 years old at the time. Um, fighting for his country, trying to do a job and trying to stay alive. Uh, he told me that it was unfortunate that they had to be shooting at each other, but you know, that's what they were assigned to do. Uh, and you know, unfortunately the two countries were, were at war with each other and, uh, that, you know, that was, that's just life. And did he remember, did he remember this, uh, this situation, this experience was this did he remember shooting at this plane and that experience? Yeah, um, he, he doesn't remember a, a lot of the details. He remembers attacking the uh, my dad's plane. You know, he had no idea whose plane it was and that his plane got hit and he had to bail out. And when he was coming down in his parachute, he could see some of the men, the crew from my dad's plane coming down their shoot, parachutes, you know, a couple of miles uh, away. Uh, he came down in Belgium and it was occupied by the Germans. So they picked him up and then he got back to his base and continued flying. Uh, and what throughout. was it like for you to actually sit with this man? Well, for the book, I just interviewed him over the telephone and through email. Uh, but I did, uh, in 2016, I went to, uh, to visit him, uh, to Munich. We filmed an interview, uh, with him. I hope to make a documentary about the book, but that, well, first of all, finding him was so exciting. I, I, my dad just knew that he was shot down by two German fighters. And, you know, it never dawned on me that I would find the guy that shot down my dad's plane. So it gives me goose, goosebumps just talking about it. <laughs> But I was so excited to talk to him. But when we met in person, you know, face to face, um, that was an amazing experience. Uh, we first went to lunch uh, right across the street at this little German uh, restaurant. We had some Wiener schnitzel and had a couple of Augustiner beers together and then went back to his apartment uh, to film the interview. I was with uh, my youngest son, who's uh, in the kind of the business uh, and then with a cameraman and we kind of rearranged his apartment he was wondering what's going on <laughs> we're, we're moving furniture and stuff and he thought we were just going to talk and all of a sudden we set up two cameras um you know and he's starting to get nervous you know? 
And we start we start the interview, but that was very very exciting. He brought out his log book and showed his entry on February eighth of nineteen forty four, where he shot down a B seventeen and he had to bail out of his plane. You know, I took pictures of that, and so we, we had a nice uh, nice chat. He was actually shot down three times uh, and still made it through the war. It's, it's an extraordinary, enc- yeah. extraordinary encounter. Yeah. I mean, yeah. here you are meeting the man who could have killed your dad. Yeah. When I, I get asked now and then, well, don't you hate this guy? He shot down your dad's plane. And I, I not no. Uh, I feel uh, kind of a personal relationship, yeah. kinship with him. You know, one specific moment in time in history, his path or his life and my dad's life crossed paths. And you know, for all these guys that fought in World War II, that was the defining moment in their lives. I mean, nothing matched uh, what they went through during the war. And it was for my dad. So it was a, a, a you know, a part of my dad's story. And Hans Berger's part of my dad's story, part of his life. So right. I felt uh, a kinship with him. And uh, I, I plan on going back to see Nahans in September because he's 95 and you know, I don't know how much longer he's going to be around or when I'm going to be able to get back to, mm-hmm. to, to Germany. So uh, I want to go visit him uh, again. Mm-hmm. Well, I think it's an extraordinary experience and I, could, and I can understand how you would not, how you could handle it the way you did. It's almost like he knew you, it's, it's, I know it sounds bizarre. But he knew you in in some indirect manner. He he knew your dad in some in you know he was a connection. It's yeah. crazy, and I can understand how you could even love this man, you know, yeah. for how wh- what he accomplished or you know whatever. I mean, it's it's amazing to me, but it's the truth. Yeah, yeah. When we were sitting there, he goes, you know, this is pretty amazing that uh, here I am, s- sitting with you know being friends with the son of a B-17 pilot that I shot down during World War II. But it's a great thing, and it's a you know wonderful thing that you know we can be friends. Yes, it's the wonder of the human. Yeah. Okay, so what other stories do you have like that one? <laughs> I know you got to have a lot. Oh, yeah, yeah. Just give me well, a, give well, us one, another one. One thing I, I have to mention is I probably wouldn't have written the book if it wasn't for two Belgian gentlemen. Okay. A one who I mentioned earlier, Dr. Paul Delahaye, and the other Jacques Lalot. And they were young boys during the war and greatly affected by it. They saw firsthand the atrocities committed against their friends and family. And later in life, they became local historians. And they interviewed Belgian people, members of the Belgium underground, about events that took place involving my dad and his crew. And they documented their testimony. And they gave me unbelievably detailed information that's in the book about events that would have been lost forever without their uh, research. So I owe them a huge debt of gratitude uh, for their dedicated uh, efforts in uh, recording this information. And they gave me, as well as a lot of the uh, Belgian people that helped my dad, gave my dad and gave me a, lots of pictures that were taken by Belgian people in 1944 that are in the book. So yeah, amazing pictures that were taken, you know, 70 years ago. So you were that, at the, you were kind of at the right place at the right time in doing this. Uh, I, I am so, so fortunate. Most people know very little about their World War II veteran, whether it's a son or daughter or a cousin or, you know, a nephew um, but I am just so blessed to have so much information about what happened to my dad uh, during the war and then uh, after uh, after he was shot down. Uh, yeah. uh, just an incredible pictures. Dr. D- Paul Delahaye, uh, he formed uh, in, in the mid 80s at the Belgium American Foundation to uh, remember and honor uh, these airmen, as I mentioned, they not only built that memorial to my dad and his crew, but they've built a number of other memorials. He died uh, in 2013 at the age, I think, of 82. But his daughter, actually, he has two daughters and a son, but uh, one of his daughters, his daughters are Crystal and uh, Severine Delahaye and Jacques Delahaye, his son. They continue his legacy, and uh, the name of the organization is now uh in English, the duty to remember association. That's where I kind of got that that tagline. Mm-hmm. And they have uh, 
uh, on the anniversary of events every year, uh, is for my dad and his crew, February 8th, they have ceremonies at the, these memorials to remember and honor. But, and then they put on these big ceremonies uh, in September because the liberation of Belgium Steve, is Steve, awesome. are they using your book in school, in the schools there, in like <laughs> high school? Uh, no, I, I, unfortunately, my book has not been translated into Fr uh, French. Uh -huh. uh, a lot of people don't realize that Belgium's a unique little country. The northern half of it, it's called Flanders, where they speak Dutch. But the southern half of it, where my dad's plane came down, is called Wallonia, where they speak French. And the northern half's pretty industrial, and the southern half is all rural farmland. So things really haven't changed in southern Belgium in hundreds of years. So all these places are still there uh, during the war. And it's just... To go for me and or my sons to go inside these farmhouses or homes where my dad was hidden and actually see the room where he stayed in is it's just fantastic. It is fantastic, you know, because I was mentioning to Steve and I and I'm sure many of you have stories similar to mine. My dad did. My dad was in uh, World War Two and I was telling Steve he did not fight. Uh, he wasn't in combat because he his shoes were too big. He wore a 13 D and they didn't have shoes big enough. So he was like in the mess hall and things like that. But the few times that he said something, which was not much when he was in Africa or he was there, he would, he mentioned climbing over bodies. That was the one thing that I remember him saying. And unfortunately, uh, I didn't ask him enough. You know? Yes, they, uh, you know, when we're when we're young, we're interested in you know when we're kids, they're our own thing, and then we you know we have we get jobs and go to college and have families, and you know you don't ask those questions until you get a little smarter and, and older. But then a lot of these vets are gone by that yes. time. Yes, and so I hear this. Yeah. I, I hear this story again and again and again by people that you know. Gosh, I don't know anything about my my. My vet, I should, I should have asked him these questions. He didn't talk about it at, at, at all. Uh, one of the things that re is rewarding for me when people read the book, uh, especially if their vet was in the 8th Air Force, is they say, well, now I have a better understanding after reading Shot Down, uh, I have a better understanding of what my vet went through as far as, you know, bombing missions over over or over Europe. So that that's... Uh, yeah, a nice feeling to know that it helps very them much. gain information. Very much. And that's why, dad. and that's why, you know, um, and when is your Vietnam show on? Wednesday. Wednesday, what time? Eight. Eight. So Amnon has a show on, on this channel, uh, eight o'clock on Wednesday nights, all about Vietnam. And I think, you know, we're talking about this kind of thing now. I think it's really relevant, you know, for those of you out there that are interested and just tune in. I mean, it's live. You'll you'll hear uh, stories, right? Mm -hmm. And first account and stories, and you know this is how history is going. You know that kind of history is going to go away. So yeah. it's important that we listen. And so one more thing I want to mention, everyone, please feel free if you've got a question, you have a story, you have a comment, anything. Call us now nine one nine five one eight nine seven seven three. Well, computers that's plural. Then the number 2K voice that will be on Skype. And then you can more than welcome into our chat and you can ask questions and comment from there as well. So Steve, continue. Okay. Um, <laughs> Tell us well, more stories. Uh, I mentioned, uh, you know, the plane, uh, my dad uh, bailed out mm -hmm. and uh, it's that my dad and the plane actually came down in Belgium, but the other men that were able to bail out, came down in France. So they were shot right over the French-Belgian border. And my dad came down, his parachute got hung up in these trees and he couldn't get down. He was dangling 20 feet off the ground. But fortunately for him, a younger, a couple of young Belgian men, uh, Raymond Durvan and Henri Franken uh, came to his rescue before the Germans got to him. They went back to this farmhouse, got a ladder and a rope, helped him down. Uh, uh, the, the, out of the trees, and this took place around one o'clock in the afternoon. They told him to stay put and hide because they thought it was too dangerous to try to move him uh, during daylight with German patrols combing the area looking for these guys that had bailed out. 
So that night they came back and got him and they took him to the farmhouse of uh, Raymond Durvan and his parents, uh, uh, Edmund and Ida Durvan. And he stayed there one night. Uh, they thought it was too dangerous for him to stay there any longer than that with those German patrols uh, combing the area. So the next night, a Belgian customs officer, Paul Tilcan, came on a tandem bicycle and take him to another location. It was pitch black, uh, middle of the night, uh, raining, and off they start on the tandem bicycle. But my dad could only pedal with one leg because uh, the other had got hit by shrapnel from this uh, these uh, anti-aircraft shells going off and the 20 millimeter cannon shells fired from these German fighters. So they came to a hill and they weren't able to pedal up it uh, anymore. So they started pushing the bike up the hill. And when they came to the top of the hill, there was a cafe, a cabaret uh, there and the lights were on, uh, music was playing, uh, there's loud uh, talking, laughter. And all of a sudden two German officers come out with their arms around these young girls and one of them comes up to my dad, puts his arm around my dad's shoulder and asks him for a light for a cigarette. But my dad couldn't speak German or French at, at that time, but fortunately Paul was able to and lit the guy's cigarette. They let him go on their way. My Hold dad, on one second. What is your father? He must have changed his clothing. Yes, uh, very good point. Uh, Paul, which is a funny story too, because Paul, he was a customs officer. They had these little pill, box, pill, pill hats, pill box hats and a cape. And he brought one of his uniforms for my dad to put on. Uh, but Paul's wife, Nellie, who I, who I was able to, to meet actually, uh, later when she saw my dad was laughing because Paul was a rather short man. My dad was tall, he was six foot three. And so the pants on my dad, you know, were way too short. <laughs> but I guess in the dark and on the bicycle, they, uh, these guys, the, the Germans really didn't notice that. And also, my dad said the, these Germans were so drunk and, you know, interested in these young girls that they really didn't pay too much attention to uh, uh, my dad and Paul, who were pushing this bike up the rain. But my dad said they were very friendly. You know, they were jabbering away. You know, again, you're drunk. I guess, fortunately, they were happy drunks and not mean drunks, I, I guess. I guess. And, you know, Steve, it's what just crossed my mind. If it wasn't for all of these people, you wouldn't be here. No, because I was born after the war in 1947. It's uh, interesting uh, and the people who read the book and these uh, in excerpts, some letters that's in the book. My dad always referred to uh, the baby. Uh, that was born while he was missing in action is Steve or Stevie, but he uh, turned out to be Nancy. <laughs> yeah, I came back to him along after the war. As my mother said, it was the best mistake they ever made. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? So he was calling your sister Stevie and didn't even know it was a girl yet. No, huh? he had no idea if it was a bro girl or boy until he got back to England uh, and then uh, found out that uh, my mother had had the baby and it was a little baby girl, Nancy. Wow. So really and truly, that's incredible. I mean, when you meet these people, his wife, this wife, this person, I mean, these people are instrumental in the fact oh, yeah. that you were born. Yeah, they saved my my dad's life. As I said, they were unbelievably brave people. And the, my dad said that all after Paul picked him up and, and uh, took him away from the uh, Durvan uh, house, after that, he was moved from place to place to place. He might spend one night at, at a house. He might spend six weeks at a house. It all depended on how brave the people were that lived there and how dangerous the Belgium underground thought it was for him to stay there. He was moved around from uh, place to place. But my dad said that the people would let them sleep in their bed. Uh, they'd sleep on the floor. They'd give him the majority of the food because everything was rationed back then. So there was a shortage of food. Uh, my dad said if he, if you stay with someone that had a little money, you know, they could buy some extra food on the black market. But if they were poor, you know, then they're eating potatoes or bread made out of sawdust and things like that. So so I'm making the assumption, correct me if I'm wrong, that your dad was the last one in the plane since he was the pilot. Correct. Yeah. And yes. so the other uh, crew members that died, were they part of the five or I think you said five that um bailed out in France, or who were yeah, they? Two, two were killed in the plane, and then three of the uh, crewmen died a couple months later on okay. the ground. On the ground. In France? Uh, actually, in Belgium. In Belgium. 
yeah, in Belgium. They came down in France, but then they, they came over to Belgium. But to find out all the details to the other members of the crew, you need to read the book. Yes, I, I, well, that's <laughs> the point. That's the point. So let's, let me hold up the book again and then just tell everybody, we're not done yet. We have more to talk about, but just tell everybody where they can find your book. Sure. Um, well, most people get it on Amazon. It's available as uh, a hardcover, softcover, every uh, ebook format. It's available as an audio book, although you don't have any pictures in the audio book. And in the ebook, uh, there's only 24 pictures as opposed to the print book that has well over 200. Mm -hmm. So, Amazon, if someone wants an autograph book, they can go on my uh, website on the home page. My uh, website is Steve Snyder, S N Y D E R author.com and you can order a, a autograph copy uh, on on my website but uh, any library can order if they don't have it in the library and any uh, bookstore if they don't have it in stock they can order it from their wholesale book distributor you know okay. Barnes and Noble or, or what have you but over 50 percent of the books that are purchased today are bought on are bought on Amazon Amazon right Amazon is uh, as <laughs> most people don't uh, realize this but amazon they change the price of the book every single day uh the retail price of the book is 27 the the, the hardcover book is 27.95 but they change the price of the book every day they might sell it for the retail price they might sell it for 19 dollars 56 it changes every day i i don't know what their algorithm i don't understand is. how is that possible I don't know. It, it, it's it's weird. As it, are, are they are you referring to them selling a used copy? No, because I can't imagine them changing your retail price. Well, they the way that works for authors is they pay the author forty five percent of the retail price, regardless of what they sell the book for. So they might discount it but the author still gets 45% of the retail price. Mm -hmm. Well, I have a couple of books on Amazon. I haven't seen them change my price. Oh yeah, they it, it's it, it's funny. And then they'll say there's only two left in stock or Right. They that stock, I've seen. They're nine and you know, I they just make all that up. I uh, <laughs> Yeah, that I've seen, but changing my retail price I, I haven't seen them do that yet. I'll have yeah. to look into that and 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 try to understand that cuz I haven't heard that before. Yeah, sometimes at the full price and sometimes it's like, you know, discounted 25, 30 percent or 11 percent. It, it changes all the time. It's I, I have no idea. Interesting. You know, they're, they're, I'll have to look into that. So t tell, is there a next for you? Well, I get asked a lot if I'm going to write another book, but right now I'm concentrating not only just on promoting uh, the book, but uh, hoping to make that documentary uh, that I'm working with. Uh, my youngest son, Clayton, uh, who is a film studies major at uh, Pepperdine University, uh, and he's also an actor. He was a child actor in middle school, then he became a water polo player and played professionally, and now he's trying to get back into acting. And so uh, he's working with a filmmaker and an editor. He's kind of the technical side of it. And we have hours and hours of footage that we filmed in Belgium and then and, and, and in Germany to try to, you know, put together to make a documentary, but it's a lot of work and yes. it, it also costs a lot of money. To yes, make it a does. Yes, it does. It all, on all levels. And so yeah. what do you, is there a particular area you want to focus in on for the documentary or is it going to reflect the book? Well, you know, we're still kind of working that through because, uh, you can talk about the story, but uh, it's also pretty interesting, you know, how the, the book came about and how I researched all this and discovered the pilot and uh, the, these houses and kind of the story be, uh, the, the, of making uh, the book or writing the book. Uh, so that it, it it's to be determined. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm not sure. We're... We would love to have a rough cut that we could take to Belgium with us for the 75th anniversary in September. Uh, whether we're able to uh, meet that timetable or time frame, uh, I don't know. We'll we'll have to see. 
We'll have to see. Well, I do think that it's a great idea to do a documentary if you can. Yeah, because you can you can actually show these places in the documentary, you know, the houses. Uh, right. Uh, because there's a, also in the book, there's a number of instances that I referred to that my dad was almost uh, found out by the Gestapo. Uh, for example, there's one instance in the book he was staying uh, at a house with the, the, some of the people that he stayed with for lengthy periods of time, he became close friends with and stayed in contact with after the war and they'd exchange letters, Christmas cards. And uh, they provided my dad with lots of, lots of pictures, but there's a one house in uh, the Charleroi, Belgium, where it was hidden. And one day there were early, or, or one day there was a loud pounding on the door. And the man who lived there, Maurice uh, Bayou, came and answered the door was the Gestapo. So he told my dad to, to climb up on the roof and stay there until he came and got him. And well, this roof, it's really pitched and it's all tile. Uh, and he had to crawl out this little little tiny window in the, in the roof. It ended up, my dad stayed up there all night. Uh, Maurice never came and got him, I guess, because he thought it was too dangerous. And I can't imagine being on this you know, steeply slanted slate roof all night long in the, in, in the cold. So there's a number of instances in the book that are described where he was almost discovered. But to be in that room, to, to look through that little window, mm. it was scary enough just to crawl up in the roof, to see those places where that, you know, history actually took place is fascinating. Well, this whole thing is fascinating. I, to, to think that your father, went, you know, to be able to have a, almost a daily account of, of what he went through, there is no question. How do you live like that for, I mean, a few days, seven seven months, and others have to live like that for years. You know, if yeah, you think that, of, yeah, if you think of Anne Frank, I mean, it makes me makes my skin curl. Yeah, it, it it was very stressful because you know, first of all, my dad's plane's attacked. You know, it's on fire. It's going down. They all have to bail out. He comes down in a foreign country, has no idea where he is. Uh, mm -hmm. Doesn't know what happened to his buddies on the crew, can't communicate with the U.S. military. And all of a sudden he's being helped by these people that are total strangers. Mm -hmm. uh, initially, he can't speak the language. He has a little French English dictionary he can refer to, but they can't communicate. Any one of these people might be a collaborator with the Gestapo and, and turn them in. So it was very stressful. I think that's one of the reasons he, he got tired of hiding and wanted to get back in the fight. Another reason was that before he went into the Air Force, he was actually in the Army in the infantry for a year uh, up in uh, Washington, state of Washington. So he had a year's worth of infantry training and he knew how to fight on the ground, unlike most airmen that just went into the Air Force. Uh, he knew what to do. And word came that uh, the Allies had landed at, uh, at Normandy. So he knew that the Allies were on uh, in in Europe, Atlanta in Europe, and so he wanted to get back in the in in the fight. And there's people that were hiding him at the time thought it was way too dangerous for him to hook up with the French Resistance. Uh, they were called the Mackey, and the French Resistance or the Mackey was made up of small ragtag guerrilla groups spread throughout uh, France. And they harassed the Germans. They would uh, sabotage communications, uh, attack railway lines or convoys, assassinate German officers. And they received their instructions over the BBC, uh, the British uh, Broadcasting, Broadcasting Corporation, through coded messages. And they were uh, supplied through air airdrops uh, by, the, by the British. And so he said, well, I'm just going to walk you know, from Belgium and walk across the border and into France and uh, try to hook up with the French resistance. I go, no, you can't do that. You'll be caught by the Germans for, for sure. So uh, one of his helpers, uh, Amy Cools, uh, they went on bicycles across the border and she hooked him up with the uh, resistance group. There are about 20 in the group that he joined up, led by a French lieutenant who had escaped from a prisoner of war camp. But here he, he hooks up with these this group of 20 people that are total strangers. He's a total foreigner. You know, they all spoke French, either they were Belgians or Frenchmen or Algerians, and they don't know for him from Adam. He could be some uh, plant or German spy, you know, that uh, 
so that 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 amazing that uh, he, he decided to do that and then uh, started sabotaging German convoys. And there's a number of in instances in the book that described about encounters that they had with the with the Germans. Mm -hmm. Interesting. I, I guess that must have been just as horrifying, if not even sometimes more hor horrifying, what he had to do. Yeah. In those it, days. Yeah. It. Uh, he said. Uh, the information they got from the British was unbelievably accurate as a result of the British breaking the uh, the Enigma code uh, of the uh, of the Germans. But Steve, that, Steve it, you're a good researcher to be oh. able. Oh, my God. I mean, I've heard some people, re, you know, I heard I've heard a lot of people, you know, researching for books, researching the book about the book, you know, all that stuff. But you really for somebody who was brand spanking new at this. Well, there, if, for people who read the book, there's an unbelievable amount of detail in the book. Uh, when I was writing the book, sometimes I would think to myself, people are going to read this and think, oh, wait a minute here. All, all this happened over 70 years ago. How does this guy know? Yeah, how did you do it? Yeah. Just Googling it? <laughs> well, the old, uh, Dr. Paul Delahaye and Jacques Malot gave me that you know, firsthand testimony by those Belgian people that were involved. There's a... The, the War Department had a had a real lengthy war crimes uh, report that they interviewed Belgian people, uh, Germans. Uh, as I as I mentioned, I had so much information, uh, you know, all the stuff my dad had and other members of the crew that that survived. Yeah, interesting, very interesting. So hold on just a second. Just you know, we have only just a few more minutes. So if anybody has a question comment, story, strategy about any of this, please call in. We'd love to hear something about your life, your grandfather, your father, your brother, whoever it is. 919-518-9773 and Computers 2K Voice on Skype. And then also you still have time to come into our chat and join us there. And while Steve is doing what he's doing, I want to remind everyone to please feel free to watch tomorrow's show um, homeopathy, the health in show, excuse me, about homeopathy tomorrow at 10 a.m. We have guests on the show tomorrow and we're going to be talking about homeoprophylaxis. And that should be very, very interesting tomorrow at 10 a.m. Um, everybody tune in the first Tuesday in the month, right? It's the first Tuesday in the month, second Tuesday in the month to uh, the health in show when we will be talking about all kinds of health issues and homeopathy. And we're going to next month, I think we're talking about gastro issues and goes on and on and on and on from there. So please t tune in. All right, Steve, did you find what you were looking for, Steve? Well, I was looking for one picture in the book that is pretty in incredible, but I couldn't put my finger on it. Describe yeah. it to our audience so that when they go buy the book, they'll know what to look for. Well, it's a story of my dad actually fighting with the French resistance and like who took the picture and how it ever got back to my father is just uh, 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 a total uh, mystery. I but think when there's for, a will, there's a way when these books are supposed I, to be written. I don't know if you can. Uh, no, we can't. What page uh, is it on? Oh, it's uh, 285. OK. So for I'm all of you out there. Go buy Steve's book and turn to page 285. Yeah, you can. That's my dad writing with Amy Cools, the, the one that took him across the border into France. And then the other picture is a, there's the farmhouse where my dad and the Mackey group stayed for a while. Amazing. Yeah, that's all still there today. It's all still there. Amazing. Yeah. Okay, hold on one second. You have my, um, none, you have mine. Okay, so just for all of you out there, my books are on Amazon as well. I have two there now in just one afternoon listening to the hearts of men, stories about lovely men and their lives. And then in just one afternoon listening to the hearts of twins, incredible stories about relationships, sibling rivalry, parenting, just uh, relationships that twins have are like just incredible. And we get to learn a lot about that. Next one up should be there in the next week or two in just one afternoon listening to the hearts of millennials. And next week I will reveal the fourth book in the series, which is in just one afternoon 
listening into the hearts of people impacted by opioid addiction. I will show you that cover next week. So you'll have to tune in. It's very cool cover. Okay. So Steve, in closing, what would you like to leave us with? What would you like to tell us? Uh, again, uh, just to emphasize what these men went through to preserve freedom for the world. A lot of people don't realize that at the beginning years of the war, the, the, the outcome was very much in doubt. Uh, the Axis powers, Japan, Germany, they, they were winning the war. And it was very tenuous. So, uh, so freedom. The, the freedom we enjoyed and what those guys do, did and the whole country did to preserve that freedom for us today is just get, can never be forgotten. So let's take it like, so let's not forget that. Let's forget what an, what an amazing um, opportunity this has been to experience the freedom we have in the United States for the most part, to walk the streets and do what we want to do and take it into yourselves and the freedom that you have to be able to do the things that you personally want to do and never forget these experiences that men like my father, like Steve's dad, and many of you out there, father, grandfather, brothers, and so forth, endured. So I want to thank you, Steve, for being here today. It's been amazing. I love all the stories. And you're terrific. You're a terrific interview. Oh, thank you very much. It was a pleasure to be on your show. Uh, you're delightful as well. Thanks. Thank you so much. And as you progress and you have more stories to tell, you want to share some things, find us, okay? Will do. Come back. Thank you so much. Right. And everyone right. out there, thanks so much for being here today. And I'm none, as always, thank you. And we will see you next week. Bye. You are tuned to the Nissan Communications Network. If you tuned in too late, you can always watch each program in its entirety or download an MP3 audio file of it in the archive section at nissancommunications.com. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, follow us on Twitter, and like us on Facebook. Sponsored by Telestream's Wirecast Software, StreamingGear.com, Carolina Apparel, and DeltaForce.net.